Hi, and welcome to my Switching View YouTube channel. And this is the second of three introductory videos on the theme of intermediate types. In these three videos, I'm describing the work of a guy called Edward Carpenter and his ideas on how best to study the history of people we might now label LGBTQIA or what Carpenter called intermediate types. Carpenter's thesis was simply that if you study such people inside the sphere of influence of Christianity, then any study will be distorted by prejudice and discrimination. The best thing to do is to look across the world in cultures before colonialism got there to export Christianity, or look at cultures back in classical times before Christianity came into being. And if you do that, Carpenter found you get a very different set of answers as to how such intermediate type people existed in the world and are perceived by other people. Often in many cultures and across hundreds, if not thousands of years, such people were accepted as being perfectly normal and often valued for what they gave to their societies. And often they were valued for two areas in particular in religion and warfare, what I'm calling queer ministry and warrior love. So in this video, I'll simply give a few examples of such queer ministry and warrior love existing across the world. And then in part three, we're looking at how sadly things went wrong and as colonialism was exported across the world, taking with it Christian prejudice against such people. These cultures were suppressed, if not destroyed. And the memory that these people existed at all has almost been forgotten. So let's start with queer ministry, intermediate type people, LGBTQIA people in the service of religion. This is an example from Kamchatka, Northeast Russia, about 1900, taken from Carpenter's own book, Intermediate Types. It frequently happens that under the supernatural influence of one of their shamans or priests, a Chuchki lad at 16 years of age will suddenly relinquish his sex and imagine himself to be a woman. He adopts a woman's attire, lets his hair grow, and devotes himself altogether to female occupation. Furthermore, this disclaimer of his sex takes a husband into the yurt and does all the work which is usually incumbent on the wife. The change of sex was usually accompanied by future shamanship. Indeed, nearly all the shamans were former delinquents of their sex. And moving across the balance into Canada, this is a text taken from an official government health report into two-spirit people in the Indigenous communities. Two-spirit is an umbrella term like intermediate types chosen by these Indigenous people to refer to the whole range of gender diverse ways of being, which may be similar to, but importantly, not exactly the same as our Western concepts of LGBTQIA. This is what the report says about how these people fitted into society before colonialism came to change things. Two-spirit individuals carried unique responsibilities that were vital to the nation's collective well-being and survival, including as teachers, knowledge keepers, healers, herbalists, childminders, spiritual leaders, interpreters, mediators, and artists. Taking up important roles within the communities, two-spirit people contributed alongside heterosexual cisgendered men and women in the maintenance of indigenous legal, cultural, and spiritual systems. This is Peru, 1554. Every temple or chief house of worship keeps one or two men or more according to the idol, who go about attired like women, even from their childhood, and talk like women and imitate them in their manner, carriage and all else. These served in the temples and were made use of almost as if by way of sanctity and religion. And I wonder if that were made use of is a reference to sexual practices in the service of religion in the temple. That reference to the possibility of sex in the temple is quite important. It reminds us that across history, then there were huge attitudes within societies to things like sex and sexuality and gender. And that's important. You can't just study interviews like people in isolation. If you want to understand how they fitted it into their cultures, you need to understand their cultures also to see what was valued and what was not. For example, in the sphere of religion, a religion that valued celibacy and had negative views about sex and sexuality might not 
value homosexuality, but a religion that saw sex and sexuality and the erotic as possibly a pathway towards God, a pathway towards the divine, might well find a role within its religion for intermediate like people, people that contained both the male and the female within themselves. And in the domain of the economic life or domestic life, a patriarchal culture which valued men and devalued women would find a problem with homosexual people or transgender people who chose to live like women. But again, a society or culture in which women and men were of equal value and had equal power and authority economically might well find that somebody who inhabited both the male and the female spheres of their culture might be a sort of win-win and find a useful role. The next two examples would illustrate what I'm talking about, how you can understand how intermediate type people were accepted by their cultures by making the effort to understand the culture they fitted within. Firstly, Japanese Buddhism, a hugely varied set of schools and teachings over one and a half thousand years. But at certain times, um, then the teaching involved the acceptance of esoteric tantric practices where sex and sexuality and the erotic was a path towards greater enlightenment. Within these schools, then whilst the sex with a woman would have been shameful, then for some form of sexual relationship within the discipline with one's novice or apprentice would have been how things were taught. There's a wonderful book, Sex and Religions, Teaching and Taboos in the History of World Faiths by Dag Ostein Ensjö, which is fascinating on homosexuality within religion, religion across the world. And he describes this. Um, there are what he calls Shigo Monogatori stories, which are basically love stories, but also stories of spiritual growth and enlightenment about these relationships between a monk and his novice or apprentice. These stories usually end with a monk losing his beloved novice, but through the loss, the monk achieves a higher plane of consciousness. It frequently emerges that the young novice is actually a manifestation of a great bodhisattva, a Buddhist saint who endows the monk with deep insights by means, among other things, of homosexual acts. And then moving on from the sphere of religion to a more domestic secular sphere, let's go to um, southwest of the USA in New Mexico. And this is Wewa, a member of the Zuni tribe who lived from 1849 to 1896. The fascinating book by a guy called Will Wasco, who gives a huge amount of detail both about Wewa and also importantly, the culture Wewa lived within. At the age of about five, Vevar, born a boy, chose to change and to spend the rest of their life living as a woman, inhabiting women's roles domestically. But importantly, in this Zuni culture, women were economically independent, had, it, had an equal status with men and could be assertive. Um, if it was women, not men, for example, who initiated divorce. Um, Weva fitted into the tribe's spirituality. There was a Kachina culture, which had various sort of archetypes of how people existed. And this was the Kohamana archetype. On one side, a warrior with a bow and arrow, the other side, a woman with a pottery basket. And this was the accepted archetype that Weva fitted within. And because the tribe accepted both women and men as of equal value, Weva was able to be a sort of spiritual and secular leader, by fitting between the male and the female domains of the tribe, they were became a counsellor, an advisor, and a leader of the tribe. At one stage, leading the tribe in a rebellion against the land grabs by the US government and being imprisoned. At other times, going even to Washington on a sort of PR offensive on behalf of the tribe and meeting the president. Before we move on, there's one question to address. And that is, if we've got people like Vewa and the other cases I've described, are we looking at what we would today describe as a case of gender identity or what is today described as a case of sexual orientation? A few things to say. Firstly, for people like Carpenter, early on in the research, they weren't aware of the difference. It's only when Magnus Hirschfeld published a book called The Transsexuals in 1920s that that distinction became clear. But even nowadays, we should be careful not to label things too much. 
Firstly, we don't have the voices of the people themselves, people like Weber's own voice, to understand what they thought about themselves. And we often have very little data. So that's why I like the label intermediate types. It has, it inc it's inclusive. It brings in the whole range of identities that we nowadays call LGBTQIA and more without labeling anything too closely. And that is helpful. The other point I want to make is simply to emphasize the importance of paying attention to history and the underside of history. And that point is best made by a quote from Dag Ostein in Show's book. These examples of situations in which male homosexuality is well integrated into the religious framework have all been taken from history. Historical circumstances have meant that these particular religious traditions have not continued unchanged through to the present day. It emerges that religions can be gay friendly, which is why it is important for us to be aware of these historical examples. And having made that point, let's go on and look at some historical examples of warrior love, intermediate type people in the service of warfare. Again, I've only got time to show three short examples in this introductory video, but I'll expand on the theme of warrior love greatly in the next but one video in the series. Firstly, Sacred Band of Thebes, 4th century BCE um, in Greece. The Sacred Band was an elite band of Theban soldiers, 300 soldiers, um, warriors and their lovers. And it was said by a huge number of writers that it was the love between these men that was the basis of their strength and their prowess of soldiers. They did not want to shame each other by being a coward, and so they fought to the end so as not to be shamed by the person they loved. And also the loving companionship, the way that people helped each other in warfare, was what was their USP, their selling point. They sound legendary or mythical, but they did exist in history. For example, the Battle of Tagara uh, was the first time any force had ever defeated the Spartans in battle, although the Spartans outnumbered the Band of Thebes. Sadly, they were wiped out at the Battle of Colonia in 338 BCE uh, by Philip of Macedonia. Um, although they were wiped out, Philip, the king of the Macedonians who had heard about this sacred band, uh, wandered around the battlefield afterwards and saw these uh, the remnants of the force and allegedly wept and said, perish any man who suspects that these men either did or suffered anything unseemly. Then moving on to Japanese samurai culture, uh, 16th to 18th century. Uh, like Japanese monk culture, it was the love of the samurai knight for his page or armor bearer, which was the essence of their code. Um, the principle of Shudo male love culture, to lay down one's life for another is a basic principle of male love. If it is not so, it becomes a matter of shame. And just two examples of artwork. Uh, the first one is a Hashiba Hideyoshi, a famous samurai knight. In the foreground with his page, Ishida Mitsunari, who later himself became a famous samurai. And you can contrast the tender way which he holds his page's hand uh, compared with the dismissive way in which another samurai treats the woman standing behind. And this code was all about beauty and art, as well as valour in battle. Um, this is a famous uh, print or painting by uh, Katsushika Hokusai, uh, showing a young man of beauty in a uh, samurai costume and sword. The text above it reads, Spring breezes and spring rains assail his lovely form. Even the dew weighs heavily on branches of the evanescent cherry. Why does he seem so lost in thought, like a beautiful woman, as he rests there on the bench, overcome with waves of tears? The final example is the boy wives of the Azandes in Central Africa, um, early part of the 20th century. Um, this is based on reports given to the anthropologist Edward Evans Pritchard of Oxford University by a number of Zande warriors about their experiences of boy wives um, in their youth. 
as reported by them to Evans Pritchard, um, in that culture, uh, women were in short supply for young men because so many were taken up into the huge harems of the royal court and others were betrothed at birth. So the custom had grown up and was quite accepted to take boy wives and this practice was fully in integrated into the customs and practice of the royal court at that time. You would find yourself a boy wife. Um, this young man had to be old enough to be an, at least an apprentice warrior. So we're talking mid-teens up to the age 20. You would purchase your boy wife with a bride gift, typically a spear, go through a normal marriage ceremony, the same ceremony as for women, and afterwards call yourself husband and wife. And the, the boy wife would then do the normal duties of any other wife, um, domestic duties, um, providing food and on manoeuvres, gathering bedding, leaves and so on. There would be sexual uh, activity. Um, there is the additional thing in these, these boy wives, some form of apprenticeship in how to be a warrior. Um, you'd learn from your husband the duties and obligations and skills of, of how to be a warrior. But also these warriors told Evans Pritchard, importantly, companionship, whether on manoeuvres or whether in the royal court, then the companionship was there of the husband and wife, just like for any normal married relationship. This Azandi system is a good example of what is called age structured homosexuality. In the modern world, we are more used to a much more stable system where in greatly simplified stereotype, you might have a few percent of the population being homosexual, a few percent bisexual, and the vast majority heterosexual, and those are stable through life. But these age structured systems were hugely common right across the indigenous world and the ancient world, where a young man might start off being the beloved or the quote wife in teens, and then in the twenties move on to being the husband or the lover, and then typically age thirty. Uh, starts to develop a married life with wives and children, while still often maintaining some sexual relationships with younger men. And that's what makes the study of homosexuality so complicated. You have these two distinct and very different systems existing in different parts of the world. And how do you make sense of that? I'll be looking at all of that in greater detail in later videos in the series. But for now, we're coming to the end of this part two introductory video. I've had to skim over some hugely nuanced and complicated stuff in a very quick way in this video. I'm sorry, but that's all I can do in the time available. I hope I've shown you my main point about um, the underside of history. We have been told so often in our Christian influence cultures that we LGBTQIA people, intermediate type people, are unnatural or disordered or in some way shameful. But if you make the effort to look at the underside of history, there's a huge amount of good quality historical data arguing against that case and showing right across history and right across millennia that examples like those that I've shown you where ingenious like people are accepted by their cultures and often given a value for what they bring to the societies they live within. I talked about eight examples. There are a huge many more I could tell you about. So it comes to the end of the video. I hope you've enjoyed it and found it interesting and useful. If you go to the switchingview.com website, you'll find some web pages created to support my YouTube channel. On the website, you'll find a schedule of every video I have uploaded or plan to upload with details of what's within each video. Also, there's what I call text and resources documents. I give a lot of detail in these videos and in these text and resources documents, I list all the evidence to support what I've said. I'm also quite a lot of information and advice for further reading if you want to follow things up. Mostly where I can, I've listed easily available documents, books, newspaper articles, websites to make it easy for you to find stuff rather than articles locked away in university libraries. For the YouTube channel, as always, if you click on the subscribe button and the little bell icon, each time I upload a video, you'll get sent an email letting you know that it's there. And finally, I'm going to ask you a favour. I put a lot of work into making these videos and I want them to be seen by the largest number of people. So if you have any friends or contacts you think might appreciate these videos, 
please do tell your friends. Please do spread the word. And that's all for now. Thank you.